Good evening, everyone. My name is Susan Sikakwaptua. I serve as the assistant agent for the Hopi Tribes Federally Recognized Tribal Extension Program. Well, U of A's Federally Recognized Tribal Extension Program, and I serve the Hopi Tribe. Um, looks like we got a lot of people from our community on tonight. Welcome. This was really designed for all of us here in Hopi land who raise backyard uh, chickens for eggs. The series was designed to serve, support and serve you all who do this. Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, I will not be teaching tonight. Thank goodness. I, I am going to turn this over to the extension specialist. She will be teaching um, like she has the last three times and she's our, our resident expert. So please ask lots of questions tonight. Um, she's here to support and help us become better egg chicken farmers for our laying hens. So tonight's session is on egg and food safety. And um, I'll turn it over to Ashley. Perfect. So I couldn't resist the pun. So we're going to talk about excellent eggs. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how chickens lay eggs, um, what could go wrong in the egg laying process. So what are some of those abnormal eggs that we sometimes see? Why do they happen? Are they safe to eat? Um, and how can we maybe stop those from happening and try to get normal eggs as much as possible? And then finally, we'll finish up with a little bit on egg safety and making sure that our eggs are safe for consumption um, from a food safety standpoint. So let's start with uh, a little basic here. Why do chickens lay eggs? So this is part of their reproductive cycle. It's how chickens make more chickens. Um, and we know we don't have to have a rooster for a hen to lay eggs. Um, she will start laying eggs around, remember we talked about that in the first, the very first one, around 18 to 22 weeks, depending on her breed, she'll start to lay eggs regularly. Um, and they will only, um, they, will, they will just be unfertilized eggs, right? So they won't ever hatch into chicks unless you have a rooster to provide the sperm to fertilize that egg, in which case they could be incubated and hatched into chicks. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what the structures are in an egg. So this is a cross view of an egg here. And this is what we're all familiar with. This is the yolk. And a lot of people think that this is the, the egg, but really this right here is what's called the ova or the ovum. And what we would refer to in other mammal species as an egg is a little confusing because we call the whole thing an egg, a chicken egg, but really in talking about other, other species, uh, birds and mammals and things, an egg is the little tiny unit that contains the cells for reproduction. And so technically this little white germinal disc here is what contains the DNA for the little baby chick and is technically the egg, although we also call it the ova or ovum. This yolk is what we think of um, in the middle. This is actually just um, supporting nutrients for that chick as it's growing inside the egg. Um, it will use that for nutrients. We have the, these membranes, these little membranes here, and you've probably seen those when you've cracked an egg and you get that little white stringy stuff in there. That's all that is, is it's actually some sort of somewhat solidified -y egg white that's designed to keep the yolk suspended in the middle of the egg. Um, and the reason that that is important is if you think about a little baby chick growing inside there when it's really little and just a little ball of cells, if that egg gets shifted or moved, you don't want it rattling around in there smashing into the side of the eggshell because that could cause damage, right? So those membranes help keep that yolk sort of centered in the middle. And then we have what's called the albumin or the egg white. That'd be the white part of our egg that's primarily just made up of proteins. And then we have the egg membranes, these also called the bloom that is on the inside there. And we'll get some up close looks at this. And then we finally have the egg shell. And then even on the outside of that in some breeds of chicken, um, we will actually have some pigmentation layer out there. And that's what makes brown, brown eggs brown and green eggs green. Um, and, that, and those colors do not generally permeate all the way through. They're just on the outside um, of the shell. So when we talk about the reproductive tract of a hen, so this is a reproductive tract of a hen, we're going to talk about all these sort of individually here. So starting with the ovary. And just like every other species, chickens do have two ovaries. However, they typically only produce yolks out of one of them. Generally, it's the left one. Fun fact for the day. So what happens is each one of these is obviously a yolk. And on that yolk is that little spot, that little germinal disc that we talked about. And so what happens is you see how all these yolks are on this ovary at different sizes. So these are constantly developing 
through hormone cycles throughout the chicken takes about 24 to 26 hours for a yolk to complete its journey from being released from the ovary going all the way through the entire reproductive tract and being laid as a full bone egg. And so what happens is, so this egg, right, this yolk right here looks like it's the biggest. So this is probably the one she would have laid that day. This is probably the one she would have laid the next day, the next day, and the next day. And as we go through, it's sort of this constant wave of yolks developing. And then some of these little ones would have started to grow up and look more like these. And eventually they would have been the ones that were laid. And so then what ends up happening um, is this yolk gets released from the ovary and gets caught by what's called the infundibulum, which is this opening right here. And if that egg was going to be fertilized to where it could um, hatch into a chick, this is where the rooster's sperm would be kind of sitting there waiting to fertilize that egg, to fertilize that little germinal disc on that yolk as it hit that infundibulum. So let's look at this a little bit closer. Here's a better one. So we see here's that mature, there's that mature ovum right there on this ready to go yolk. And we see these others that are developing. And these are what are called the immature follicles that are gonna develop eventually and form their own yolks and be ready to be um, the released. So after the infundibulum, um, it then moves into this part of the, of the uh, tract and into what's called the magnum. And at this point, this is where the egg whites are added. So that albumin coating will be added. Those interior membranes will go on. It will move into the isthmus, which is where that bloom, that membrane that goes all the way around the outside of the egg will be added. And if you've ever had what's called a rubber egg laid, that's just the membrane. It means that that egg was laid without a shell. So the next place that it goes then is to the shell gland, which is where that outside hard egg shell is deposited. At the end of that egg shell gland are pigmentation. So if that chicken lays anything other than a white egg, if she lays a brown egg or a chocolate brown egg or a green egg or, or a blue egg, that pigment will be added at that point. And then we will reach the cloaca, which is where the egg is exits the body and where she lays her egg. So that's sort of an overview of what we're talking about. We're talking about this cycle. And the reason this is important is it can help you understand um, when some of these abnormalities happen, why and what is happening in the process. This is a really good link to check out um, some of the eggshell abnormalities that occur, which we're gonna talk quite a bit about too, um, if you're interested in those. And you can see the variety of egg colors that we have here. So the first egg abnormality um, that I really wanna talk about, this happens quite a bit is blood in the egg. You, you take an egg out of the refrigerator or off the counter and you crack it and you end up with this. Sometimes it's just a little blood spot like this. Sometimes it's smaller. Sometimes it's the entire like egg white is full of blood. And this, this looks terrifying and gross and scary, um, but it's really not. The blood vessels in the ovary or the oviduct ruptured during the egg laying process. So often what happens is when that egg yolk splits off from the ovary, um, it's split someplace other than what's called the stigma. So this is the stigma. If you take a look at this um, fully developed yolk here, you see all these um, blood vessels sort of lining this outside. And you see this really clearly defined line where there's no blood vessels that cross it. That's called the stigma. And that is where that yolk should break off when it's ready to go in and become an egg. But sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it breaks off or at a different angle or, or something happens where it just doesn't break off right where it's supposed to on that stigma. And that often is the cause of blood vessels um, in, the over, in the egg when you, um, when you crack that egg. Generally, this happens for a few reasons. Sometimes it's just because they're new layers. And you'll see kind of a couple themes emerge here as to the causes of some of these egg abnormalities. So kind of pay attention to them. And when we get to the end, we'll talk about them. Um, sometimes it's, it's just that it's a new layer and oopsie things happen. Um, but this could also really be caused by excess lighting or abrupt changes in our lighting pattern. So if we are going to put our chickens on lights to help them continue to lay eggs for longer in the wintertime, um, we just want to make sure that we're making those changes gradually. And we're trying to stick to no more than about that 16 hours of daylight per day mark. So, so more is not always better. Um, 16 is, is kind of the, the sweet spot there. And if we start going over, we start having problems like this um, in our eggs. So the next thing you wanna talk about is maybe a problem, maybe sometimes not, is double and triple yolkers. 
And so what has happened in this case is that two or more yolks have been released at the same time and got bundled into the same egg. Sometimes it's a fun little bonus when you crack an egg into a bowl and, oh, hey, there was two yolks in there. That's pretty cool. A lot of times we see this with new layers um, as that we can kind of think of that reproductive cycle a little bit like an engine. It needs a little time to get warmed up. And often when layers are either brand new to laying because they're young, or maybe they're coming back into production after having been off from being broody, from molting, from the heat of the summer, from the winter, um, sometimes it takes a little bit to kind of knock the dust off and get the cycle going again. And we can see these double and triple yolkers. Some breeds are way more prone to this than others. Um, the problems that you could see because of this, though, are um, sometimes these eggs, are, these eggs are big, right? They're often quite a bit bigger than a regular size egg. You can see this comparison to a regular egg. And this is either, this is, I think, is actually this triple yolker here. I mean, it's at least 30 to 40% bigger than this other egg in terms of size. So you can imagine um, if you're a hen having to lay this egg, you have a possibility of getting egg bound, especially if you're a young new layer who hasn't been laying a lot. You have a possibility of having this get stuck in your reproductive tract. Um, and I think we talked about that when we talked about chicken diseases, that egg bound was a problem. So this is not something we want to encourage, but it does occasionally happen and it's usually okay. In this case, you see this is an egg and a yolk within an egg. So what happens, this looks like it's probably a fairy egg, which I'm gonna talk about next. And it probably got started down the repro tract and got held up by something, potentially stress, something like that. It, it just didn't work its way down the tract. It got caught up in the yolk that came down behind it and then got sort of just bundled together into the next egg. So let's talk about those fairy eggs. So they have a lot of other names, including some not, or not, not as nice ones like fart eggs. Um, but fairy eggs is most commonly what they're called. And basically what has happened is um, an egg begins forming before a yolk is released. Sometimes they have like this one, a really tiny yolk. Sometimes they just have like a little piece of tissue that has broken off from the ovary in them. And it sort of triggered the egg laying cycle to begin. And it sort of triggered the formation of an egg, but there wasn't really a yolk there to support it. So oftentimes they're empty. They're just full of egg white and nothing else. Um, these aren't generally a problem. You only see them occasionally. And again, generally, this is just due to being a new layer um, or coming back from something else. I see this one is interesting because it's perfectly round. Um, this one is more normal egg shape, but pretty small. So let's talk now about those rubber or soft shelled eggs. So I know we've, we've had those before where um, if you, when you kind of grab them, there's no shell to them, right? They just sort of collapse in your hand and they're, they're just soft. Um, again, this is normally a new layer problem. What basically happened was that egg came down, got its white, got its membranes, and then just sort of skipped the shell process. Um, a lot of times it's, again, new layers. There are some diseases that can cause this to happen with more frequency. Um, avian influenza, Newcastle disease, um, bronchitis, and then there's something called egg drop syndrome. And also some nutritional problems like um, not enough calcium can cause this to, to happen as well. I also see it sometimes if hens are excessively stressed. The heat of the summer seems to bring this out. Um, I think that's probably also somewhat a nutrition related problem. Um, in the heat of the summer when it's super hot out, a lot of times these hens just don't want to consume as much feed as they really should be. And so we end up with sort of a little malnutrition situation going on. Um, just because they don't feel like eating because it's so hot. Um, if this is happening here and there, um, an egg every month, maybe a little less, depending on how many chickens you have, it's not really cause for concern. As with anything, oopsie eggs sometimes just happen. If you start seeing this with relative frequency, like it just keeps sort of happening every week or every, you know, every few days, you need to maybe look a little bit deeper into the into the what could be the cause. Is it stress? Do you have predators, dogs, kids harassing chickens? Do you have a disease going on? Are you are your chickens showing any other signs of disease? Um, and are they on a good plane of nutrition? Are we feeding them appropriate food at appropriate levels? The other thing that can happen is what's called a, sh a soft shell egg. Um, and so it's similar to a rubber egg, except it, it probably got some shell, but it's just really thin. So you'll pick it up and it'll sort of just crack and crackle all the way around, um, but it definitely doesn't have the integrity of a full um, eggshell. 
Um, sometimes this is too much phosphorus. So calcium is what makes up most of the egg shell. Calcium and phosphorus, you can think of them as sort of polar opposites um, in terms of that the body needs both in a certain relationship and a certain ratio. And if that ratio gets inverted, if you have more phosphorus than you do calcium, um, it causes some problems. And this is one of the problems it can cause. It can cause them to not put enough calcium into their egg shells um, because they're trying to counteract the too much phosphorus that they already have going on in their bodies. Again, heat stress and nutrition for the same problem. Also, sometimes older hens, their shell glands just stop functioning as well. Um, and so you end up with these sort of crackly, half-shelled sort of eggs. I've had some that were like rubber and on one side and then the soft shell with like, like a half of the intact shell on the other. It was super weird. Um, I think that that one was probably a little bit stress related. It was in the summertime, so. Um, mispigmented eggs. So sometimes this is just a weird thing where, um, first of all, some hens always lay certain pigments. So some hens will always lay eggs with spots or certain colors. And sometimes it's just that their pigmentation gland is weird or maybe got an injury at one point or something. Sometimes it's a different problem. So like, for example, that green egg, it looks like that egg got hung up in the, in the pigmentation process and ended up with a little extra pigmentation on the end. Again, this is often stress. Um, however, things like these white dots, this is the opposite problem of those soft shell. This is excess calcium and they're trying to sort of get rid of it. And you end up with these little white and you'll, you'll feel them actually, be, they'll be raised up. Almost like somebody took like, drywall spackling and flung it at the egg and you'll get this like spotted pattern on them. So sometimes it's too much calcium in the diet. Um, often changes in lighting can trigger these sort of mispigmentation changes where you get these weird striations um, or weird, weird patterns or anything like that. So if you start seeing things that are out of the ordinary for what your birds normally lay, if they normally lay a solid green egg and you suddenly get stuff like this and it continues to happen, um, you might want to take a little bit of a look at your management and make sure, again, the stress, the calcium, our lighting, that all of our management practices are, are, are done as best as we could be doing them. Corrugated eggs. These are kind of cool. I've never had these. Um, they come out with wrinkles, and this is a hard-shelled egg. Like, if you, you grab it, it feels like an egg. There's, that shell is just formed in this wave pattern. Um, often we see this due to heat stress. It affects older birds much more often, um, and poor nutrition can really contribute to this. Um, now, if we get these sort of thin, wrinkly creases all the way around the egg, like these are sort of what I call like big, big waves, but if we get these sort of thin, wrinkly type creases, um, that can also of, often be a symptom of bronchitis, um, especially if we have respiratory symptoms at the same time and you start seeing um, eggs that look somewhat similar to this, you could potentially have a bronchitis outbreak brewing amongst your flock and something you wanna take a look at. Sometimes it's just shell gland defects as well. Sometimes shell glands, they get injured, they get malformed, something happens to them and they sort of lay these irregularly type eggs for quite some time. Um, so misshapen eggs um, are eggs that are too big, too small, Sometimes they're flat on one side like this one, um, perfectly round or too oblong and teardrop shaped like this one is. Um, again, those new layers sometimes uh, do weird things as they're trying to get their system up and going. Oftentimes these flat ones, what has happened is that another egg got held up in production um, at some point in the chain and the egg behind it or in front of it sort of, they got caught up to one another and smushed together and so you ended up with this sort of misshapen flat on one side type egg. Um, stress, some diseases, changes in lighting, all those things can contribute to these types of problems. Again, if you only see one-offs here and there, it's not a problem. Sometimes these changes are permanent. I had one hen that laid eggs like this. Um, she, had a, she had a disease, she recovered, but she laid more teardrop shaped eggs for the rest of her life. Um, so sometimes these changes are permanent. It's one of those things where get to know your birds um, so you can keep an eye out for when these things do happen. Broken and repaired. 
So what happened with this egg is um, it got broken at some point while in the reproductive tract and it just got mended in the shell gland. It was still in the shell gland when that happened. And so it was able to be put back together with a little more shell added. Um, oftentimes this is caused by stress of some kind during the calcification process, a predator attack. You know, the predator or a dog comes and the chickens flop out of the nest box um, or wherever they are and they end up, they end up with some trauma and, and break that egg inside of them. Um, so this is where we start to talk a little bit about what is safe to eat and what is not. So all the previous eggs that I've talked about are safe to eat. The misshapens, maybe not the rubber eggs, I wouldn't eat those. Um, but like if they're just misshapen, if they're mispigmented, it's perfectly fine to eat those. There's nothing wrong with them. These broken and repaired, basically anything that disrupts the eggshell itself, because that eggshell and the membranes underneath it are what protect that egg from entry by bacteria and other things. That, that's when we sort of draw the line on when it's safe to eat them. So like, for example, this one was broken and repaired. And while it's probably okay, it's probably also, I just probably wouldn't risk it just because that, that membrane was broken. We don't know if the, or the shell was broken. We don't know if the membranes were ruptured and it created an opportunity for bacteria to be introduced. And so it's better to err on the side of caution. Same thing with the rubber, the, the shellless or soft shelled eggs. Um, what I tend to do with those, quite frankly, is my dogs get those. Um, that's that's their, that gets up, put over their dinner and they're very happy dogs. The next one we're gonna talk about is a lash egg. Lash eggs are not eggs. Do not eat them. I do not even recommend, they are, they are disgusting. All they are really is a big gob of pus, eggshell, white, probably some yolk in there. And generally this is caused by an infection within the reproductive tract. This is not good. And it is usually fatal to the hen. There have been some people who have had success working with their veterinarian and treating a hen with antibiotics. It is very difficult to get antibiotics to the right part of the body to, to successfully treat this infection, but I have heard of it being done and of hens recovering either to at least live a normal life and maybe even to go back to laying normal eggs. But if you do get one of these lash eggs and you will know it because you will know by the smell and it doesn't even really resemble an egg and they're just balls of nastiness, not a real egg, do not eat the lash egg. With most of these, hopefully you guys noticed some common themes and what causes a lot of these egg abnormalities, right? So what were some of the themes that we saw? We saw nutrition, right? Heat stress, new layers. Sometimes they're just oopsies that happen from new layers. Stress from predators or whatever. Changes in lighting, okay? So, so how can we prevent some of these egg abnormalities, some of which are probably gonna happen at some level anyway, but we can prevent the majority of them. We can do, we can make sure our, our hens are getting good nutrition, that they're getting layer feed in the right amounts that has calcium that they need to make good eggshells, that we're keeping treats reasonable, um, that we have our chickens as less stressed as possible. So that means a big enough coop that we don't have a lot of fighting going on, that we aren't constantly being harassed by predators or dogs or that sort of thing. Um, if we live in Southern Arizona, particularly, or as someplace warmer, maybe, maybe Western Arizona too, um, we have some form of heat abatement plan in place. Even some of you guys up north still get to like 90. It's pretty warm. You may not need misters like I do, but you may be a fan or, or at least shade and cool water is important. Um, if we're doing a lighting schedule that we're maintaining an appropriate one, um, about 16 hours, that we don't change it abruptly, that we work our way to where we want to be. Uh, we don't just take them from eight hours of light to 16 hours of light. That's going to really mess things up. That we're monitoring for diseases, practicing good biosecurity. I think our last talk was on diseases. We recognize that sometimes these things just happen, particularly those soft-shelled and rubber eggs. I see those a lot. Um, if there's a break in laying, if they're old birds or if they're new layers. Um, and occasionally it's just a genetic defect or injury um, that is going to happen um, because they're, they're animals and things get weird sometimes that we can't explain. So now that we've talked about some of those egg abnormalities that we've seen, and I didn't even have the picture in here that I wanted to show you of the best one. Um, somebody sent me one that um, it looks like what happened was when the yolk 
came off, it took part of the ovary with it um, and pulled the whole ovary through the tract. And so what you end up with is an egg with a little gross alien looking ovary tail hanging out the end of it. It was sort of gross and fascinating at the same time. I'm going to say that that chicken was probably less than fertile after that, maybe even completely infertile, but from what I understand, she was fine. Um, that was one I'd never seen before. And again, sometimes these weird things just sort of happen. So let's move on a little bit and talk about that egg safety. So as I mentioned, most of the egg abnormalities presented um, are perfectly safe to eat. Um, obviously not the lash egg, because that's not a real egg. But um, again, those broken shells, those soft shells, um, or the no shells, because we've disrupted that shell process, um, we probably should refrain from eating those. Uh, definitely only consume eggs that are clean. Um, they don't have feces smeared on them. If you're getting consistently dirty eggs, that's not normal. Um, normally chickens lay very clean eggs. They don't generally have much more, maybe the occasional smear of something on them, but as a rule, they should come out. That one in my hand just came out of a chicken and they almost always look exactly like that, beautiful and clean. So if you're getting consistently dirty eggs, we need to look at a couple of things. Number one, we need to check your chickens for parasite or nutrition problems that could be causing runny droppings where they're, it's sort of matting up around their vent feathers um, and causing really dirty eggs um, when they lay them. The other thing that could be causing this problem is if our coop is really dirty and they're tracking it in on their feet into the nest box or if they're sleeping in the nest box. And I'll talk about that in just a second here. Um, we wanna make sure that as we're, our chickens are laying eggs, that we're picking them up in a timely fashion, especially in the summertime. Um, you know, most of the year, daily is fine. We can get away with just picking up eggs in the evening or, or maybe you know, late in the morning if we go out there. In the summer temps, I highly recommend if you can, if you're home, pick up those eggs as frequently as you're able, a couple of times a day at least. The longer they sit out in those hot summer temps, the more likely they are to go ahead and incubate and breed any potential bacteria that could be on them. Um, if you're purchasing chicks or hens, purchase from a, a, a supposed to say a reputable breeder or um, hatchery, MPIP certified. Um, if if you can, that's a really great program. Um, I have the MPIP link. I think I gave to Yvonne to throw you in the chat. Um, the nice thing about that is it does a lot of testing for salmonella. So salmonella is something that your birds could have and not be sick at all from it. They just sort of carry it and they're shedding it in their eggs. Um, and when you consume them, if you don't fully cook that egg product to 160, which means set yolks and set whites. And I know many people like myself enjoy a nice sunny side up egg that does not have a set white or a set yolk. Um, you could be at risk for salmonella. So there is testing that can be done to see if your flock is salmonella free, but if you're buying from reputable breeders, uh, good hatcheries, um, doing all the things right, you're probably fine. Um, make sure that you are cautious with all medications and treatments. Use Read all the labels and only use products labeled for use in the laying hands. This is where things get a little tricky. There are a lot of products that are labeled in other countries but are not necessarily labeled here simply because we haven't had enough call to pay for the testing necessary to get the approvals through the FDA. But you can consult a vet if needed. Having that relationship is very helpful. Um, so let's talk about that real quick. Um, this is sort of important for both layers and if you are raising any, any birds for meat. I know we haven't really talked about that during this series. Um, all medications are approved by the FDA for use in food animals must be labeled that way. And they will have established what is called a withdrawal time. And so a withdrawal time is the time from the last treatment that you gave that animal, so the last dose of medication you gave them, until the FDA has determined through testing that you can safely cons either consume the eggs or harvest the animal for consumption and know that the medication that you gave that animal will have completely cleared their system and there will be no residues in the meat um, or egg product that you would then end up consuming. Okay, if that makes sense. So this is how the FDA has, has um, communicates how to keep yourself safe. Um, so some medications, um, for example, bembendazole is a good one, are approved in other countries like Canada and the United Kingdom, but they're not approved in the United States for laying hens simply because we haven't gone through the testing um, procedure. But what you'll see on any label, um, 
So this is a dewormer, tells you how to use it, um, administered orally, one capsule per four to seven pounds of body weight, repeat in 10 days. If you have a severe case used for three consecutive days, it can be used every 30 to 90. And they suggest, because this is actually a product that has not been approved, um, they suggest an egg meat withdrawal time from seven to 17 days and one to six days for meat. Now, if you were to look at the label for this product from say Canada, that's actually been approved by their equivalent of the FDA. And they say there is no withdrawal time for laying hens um, for egg or meat purposes. So things vary by country, sometimes for no apparent reason, but the best thing you can do is always just follow the label um, that will never lead you astray. Um, and that includes things like the dosage. So how much to give per pound of bird, how you give it, the amount of administration, is it administered via an injection? Is it given in their food? Is it given in their water? Because all these things affect the withdrawal time, right? So how we got it into the bird is gonna affect and how much we gave it is gonna affect how long it takes to fully clear their system before we're able to consume again, to consume products from that animal again. When in doubt, work with a veterinarian. Um, the only way that it is legal to use a product off label is with the oversight of a veterinarian. And so the types of medications we're talking about, these include our dewormers, which are enthelmintics, um, things like finbendazole, ivermectin, those types of products. Um, external pest control products, so things designed to kill lice like the permethrins, pyrethrins, those types of products. Coccidiostats, um, which would be like our amprolium that we use in our chicks uh, to potentially to prevent uh, coccidiosis. Um, it's also available, um, Corid, I think it's called, to treat adult hens who have coccidiosis. That is still available over the counter. Um, any antibiotics that we may use, any sort of painkiller type product, and a lot of wound treatments, um, read them very carefully. Some of them are not approved for use in food animals and particularly looking at blue coat. You know, that's a very popular one for wound treatments. Um, but if at some point you, your bird is destined for the stew pot, um, do know that that is not um, licensed for use in food animals. So you might need to find something different to treat your bird with if they get an injury. So as we sort of finish up here talking about food safety, the biggest takeaway I have for you is that healthy chickens lay healthy eggs. So purchasing those healthy chicks or healthy chickens from a good quality breeder who takes the time to house chickens in, um, in a good area, um, house chickens properly really will make a difference. Um, the MPIP certification is completely voluntary. It's run um, by the Arizona Department of Ag and they do help with testing for salmonella and influenza. It is a free program. They don't charge any fees. The only thing is you have to buy your testing, testing supplies yourself. Um, and there is somebody who will work with you if you are interested in becoming MPIP certified. The other thing is good nutrition, um, you know, making sure these birds are healthy so they have a good immune system. And we talked about all this um, during the nutrition one that we did and also during the diseases one, making sure that those birds have a really good plan of nutrition will help keep their immune system in top shape. Um, so that they are able to fight off any diseases they might be exposed to. Keeping our coop clean, making sure that we're not overcrowding so that we don't have a lot of feces buildup. Um, keeping those pest animals out, wild birds in particular. Um, we talked about them spreading things like Newcastle potentially, um, keeping rodents out, all those sorts of things. Uh, making sure our birds have access to clean water. Coccidiosis really spreads through the water very quickly. Um, if we when we're handling our birds, uh, make sure that we wash our hands after we handle them, change our shoes and probably change our clothes if we're gonna be preparing food, especially if we're coming in from the coop, it's easy to go out and feed, come in, wanna make dinner, just change your, change your clothes, change your shirt and wash up so that if your birds do have something like salmonella or anything like that, you're not bringing that in and potentially preparing fresh produce or something um, and contaminating that. And now the age old controversial question, to wash or not to wash my eggs? So um, the reason this is controversial is a lot of people um, were washing in incorrectly and actually causing more problems. So improperly washed eggs are probably worse than unwashed eggs. Also, people were washing excessively dirty eggs. And as we said before, excessively dirty eggs really just shouldn't even be used. Don't, don't try to wash a very, very dirty egg. Just throw it away, 
maybe the dogs enjoy it, something like that. Um, but it's not worth it to try to clean it up. Remember that, that that shell membrane and shell itself, while they do offer a measure of protection to our eggs, they're not impermeable. They are porous. They do allow breathing. In fact, that's one of the ways how they tell the freshness of an egg is they actually look at that little air sac at the end of the egg in that first picture I showed you. And they look at how big it is. And so in an older egg, more air has actually permeated into the, into the egg itself and some moisture has left. And so that air sac will be bigger um, in an older egg, a less fresh egg, if that makes sense. So some guidelines, um, if you do want to wash, dry wiping or brushing things off of eggs is 100% safe. You can absolutely do that. If you have very dirty eggs, as I said, don't try to wash those. Um, use warm running water. So don't, don't submerge them in a static container of water. Um, that allows bacteria to just sort of float around in there. And if you have one egg that's contaminated, it would then contaminate the others. It's best to wash them under running water. And you wanna make sure that that water is at least 20 degrees higher temperature than the eggs are. Um, preferably at least 90 degrees Fahrenheit. And the reason for that is, if the eggs are colder, they will not um, be as inclined to suck stuff into the shell, right? So if we think about it, if there's bacteria on the outside of the shell, that's what we wanna wash away. And those eggs are, are warmer, sorry, excuse me, I did this backwards. If the eggs are warmer than the water, some of that water will end up getting sort of sucked in to the, to the shell, will bring bacteria and things along with it. If those eggs are colder than the outside water, that doesn't happen, it actually goes the other way. And so you won't be sucking that stuff into the shell and potentially into the egg. Um, you can use a brush, you can use an unscented detergent. There's some specialty products made for washing eggs or um, a small amount of preferably unscented detergent. Again, remember eggs are porous. Do not want them tasting like Dawn dish soap. Um, the sanitizer that is recommended is bleach, a very, very dilute bleach and I could get the number for you. I don't have it up at the moment, but it's like a teaspoon to a gallon or something. It's a super dilute amount. And again, quick run them through and get them out. Don't let them soak in it. You don't want them sucking it in. Um, if needed, always dry your washed eggs very thoroughly. And once you've washed them, they must be refrigerated. Um, when you first pick eggs up, they actually have what's called the bloom, which is part of that membrane that's on that inside of that shell. And after you've washed them, you've actually washed away that protective bloom. Um, so as long as that bloom is intact in an unwashed egg, they can actually stay at what we call room temperature, which is between 68 and 77 degrees Fahrenheit um, and be fine. They won't spoil very quickly. They can stay on the counter for some time and still be used safely. But once you've washed them, you've destroyed that bloom, you've destroyed that protective layer, and they are gonna go bad much more quickly. So they should be refrigerated if you do choose to wash them. Now, um, and I know this isn't gonna necessarily apply on the tribal reservations. I don't know what, what your rules are. Um, in the state of Arizona, if you are selling anywhere off the, the reservations, um, nest run eggs, are not allowed to be washed. So anybody can register as a nest run producer for free and sell up to 750 dozen eggs per calendar year um, with the Arizona Department of Ag and be legal. There are some other guidelines that go along with this um, in terms of labeling requirements. You can't call them fresh, but you can put the date they were laid. Um, there's some requirements about how old they could be, what things can be in and on the packaging and that kind of stuff. But the other big one is they can't be washed. Um, so if you do plan to sell anywhere else, those are the rules. Um, all that is listed when you sign up to be an escrow producer. Um, anywhere else, I'm not sure what your rules, they might be different. Um, so just check with whoever your governing body is that would tell you what you are and aren't allowed to do with washing your eggs, because it may be different. The other question I get asked very frequently, why are my eggs so dirty? Um, so if you're having a problem with consistently dirty eggs and it's not a parasite or nutrition problem um, or any of those other things that we kind of talked about with the matted, dirty vent, feathers, that kind of thing. The other problem I commonly see, nest boxes are for egg laying and roosts are for sleeping. So if your chickens have decided to be lazy and sleep in the nest boxes, what happens is when chickens um, eat, they eat a lot all day. They store food in their crop. If you remember from the nutritional, we talked a little bit about the digestive system. 
they store food in their crop. So they eat a lot right before bed and then they sort of digest all that overnight. It goes down through their gizzard and through the rest of the digestive, through their digestive tract. And so what ends up happening is all night they're sort of digesting and pooping all night. So you'll see a lot of droppings build up underneath the roost. So if they're sleeping in their nest boxes, they are pooping in their nest boxes. So a lot of times they see that as a reason for dirty eggs. Um, and if you don't necessarily go out there right at night when they're going to sleep to see where they're sleeping, you may not even know that they're doing that. So how we combat that is um, nest boxes should be fairly close to the ground, you know, uh, you know 18 inches or under. Um, they don't need to be very high off the ground. And our roosts need to be taller than that. So what I like to do is start my bottom roost rung at about 18 inches. And I like this ladder style, like this guy has here, um, where they can just start at the bottom one and sort of hop their way up. And they will tend to sleep on the highest one possible. They like to sleep nice and high because they are prey animals and they feel safer up there. And that will help get them out of your nest boxes. If you have chronic nest box sleepers and you go in and restructure your roost, you may still need to retrain them to get them back on the roost. They may, they're creatures of habit and they will probably still try to go to the nest box. My suggestion is then that you go out maybe an hour before dusk. They should all be done laying eggs for the day at that point and use something to block those nest boxes off. They will be very gripey at you the first night because they will want to go in there and they can't get in there, but they will eventually go to the roost. Just make sure you go take it down again in the morning and you'll probably need to repeat that a few nights until they sort of get the hang of going back to the roost where they're supposed to be sleeping. Also make sure that you don't set your coop up so that your nest boxes are directly underneath your roost. Again, if they're gonna be sitting up there all night, digesting and pooping, we don't want that falling into the nest boxes because um, that defeats the whole purpose. Um, the other thing is if we have too few nest boxes for the number of hens that we have, we have a lot more chance of fecal contamination or breakage of eggs in the box as all five hens try to cram into one, you know, if they all five try to cram into one box at the same time, we have more chance of breaking any eggs that might already be in that box. Uh, hens are a little bit clumsy and will tend to do that. The general rule of thumb is to have one box for every four to five hens that you have. So if you have 20 hens, you would probably want to have four or five boxes available. And they'll probably still try to all use one, but try to make them all, um, try to make them all the same. Um, chickens like nest boxes that are very dark, secluded, sort of private, um, so if like one is out on the end and it doesn't have a side wall, they'll probably be less likely to use that one. So try to make them all sort of um, private and inviting and dark and quiet and all those things to encourage them to use them all. And finally, dirty coop floors mean dirty feet um, and dirty feet track dirt and fecal matter and all those things into the nest boxes. So make sure we're kind of cleaning our coop fairly regularly, staying on top of that manure so that we aren't um, tracking it into the nest boxes all the time. So if we plan to hatch chicks, and this isn't something that I've done a whole lot of, but there are some general guidelines that can help us. Um, number one, ensure your hens are healthy, have good nutrition, free from stress, all those things we've been talking about here. Select eggs from hens that have been laying at least a few months. So don't start hoarding eggs from your brand new layers. Um, just as there may sometimes be external shell abnormalities with those new layers as they sort of get things going, there could also be problems um, other problems going on, maybe one missed a germinal disc or doesn't have quite enough yolk or things like that as they sort of get things going. So it's better to give them a chance to sort of get that reproductive engine up and running, get everything, all the kinks ironed out, um, and then you can start keeping eggs from those hens. Um, select eggs that are fresh, preferably less than seven days old and as clean as possible. Um, if you have to wash them, because you, you know, you just, you really want these eggs because they were from this rooster and this hen or whatever. You can wash them gently if you have to, but it's a lot better if you don't wash them. So it's best that they be as clean an egg as can be. Um, we don't wanna, we don't really wanna disrupt that bloom um, because that's what's gonna keep that chick healthy inside that egg. If bacteria get in there and contaminate the chick while it's trying to grow, um, it becomes a real mess. Um, select eggs that are as close to normal as possible. Don't use anything that's abnormally shaped, you know, with those flat sides, um, the shell is, any of those, don't, don't even try with those. They're going to come out, you know, you're going to end up with a chick that gets stuck and can't get out or doesn't develop properly because it's got one side mashed in. Um, and also don't use suspected double yolks. You will not get twins. They just won't, it won't develop. 
Uh, there just isn't enough room in an egg for twins. It just doesn't work. Um, and finally, no cracks or overly porous eggs. Um, you can do a process that's called candling to check, um, where you take a flashlight and you can hold that egg. And I wish I had a picture, but I don't. Um, and shine it through that egg. And you can actually see the blood veins developing on the inside um, and the little chick developing, developing. And you can keep an eye on these throughout the process and make sure that nothing has gone awry um, and you haven't had a chick die um, in, in the egg um, during the process. I would like to thank all these people here who graciously contributed to me all those pictures of those abnormal eggs. Um, I put out a call and said, I need some pictures and they came through for me. So, and I'm gonna see if I can find that over one while everybody is thinking of questions. Great, thank you so much, Ashley. I see the first question from Mary here. I'm just gonna start with a few of them too. Sure. Uh, what color should eggs be? Um, white, white eggs are not bleached. So some breeds of chicken naturally lay a white or a cream colored egg. That's, that's totally normal. What color the egg should be is gonna depend on what color your chicken is genetically going to lay. So some, some, like I said, some will lay white, like those leghorns, that's that standard commercial breed, lay those white eggs we see in the store. They're not bleached. They're not um, colored in any way. That's what color they come out of the hen. There's a lot of breeds that lay some variation of brown, light brown to medium brown to dark brown. You know, things like our Rhode Island Reds, um, our Black Stars, Barred Rocks, those all lay a, a generally a brown egg. We have things like Copper Morans or Cuckoo Morans. There's a whole bunch of Morans that lay a chocolate brown, dark, dark chocolate brown colored egg. Um, Olive Eggers, Easter Eggers, Americanas, there's a whole variety that lay anywhere from pink to blue to green. So it just depends on um, what, what genetically your chicken is supposed to lay. And internally, they're all the same. There's no difference in nutrition between a, a white egg or a brown egg or a green egg or a chocolate brown egg. They're all, they're all eggs. They all taste the same and they all have the same nutrition. So that was a really good question. There was another question about broken and repaired eggs. Are they okay to feed back to hens? Yes. However, if you want to feed eggs back to hens, and when people do do this, it is a really great way to get some protein back into their diet. I highly recommend cooking those eggs first, scramble them. One thing you don't want to do is teach your hens that eggs are tasty because then what will happen is you will end up with hens who get into the nest boxes and start eating eggs before you can collect them. Um, and reforming an egg eater is a nightmare, if not in some cases, almost impossible to do. Um, so always crack the shells and cook those eggs so that they are different than a raw egg and they don't equate the two and decide to get in the nest box and start eating eggs. Does the rule for medications also apply to medicated feed? Yes, it does. Anything, anything with a medication um, in a product in it, and that will always be listed very clearly on the label on um, what the product is, what it is for, um, and how much is in there per per pound of feed or sometimes it's gram of feed, however they've listed it on the label. Um, but that will always be listed on the label of the feed. Um, and those eggs following, is it okay? Oh yeah, totally, totally okay to toss them in the compost. Yeah, that, sh that, that stuff will break down um, in the heat generated by the compost. So that should be no problem. When you're transitioning your, your baby chicks from medicated to, to laying, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, so just layer feed, um, timing that would be helpful as well because once they start laying and they're eating medicated feed, you do not want to eat those eggs. Right. You know, let me see what the withdrawal period is for, and this will be a good exercise for us. Let's see. I'm holding. So just as, as, as a participant, if, if you're rain, um, raising the little babies and they start to lay about five months or so, you can begin to transition them. If you know the, the general timing away from the medicated feed. Although, so I generally don't use the medicated stuff much beyond about the time they go out of the brooder and into the coop, which usually happens around eight to 10 weeks, depending. That's about the time they've got all their feathers. Um, I usually go ahead and switch off of it at that point if I'm on it. However, there is no withdrawal time for emperolium. You can actually feed that right up until the day they start laying if you want to. It will not. They So what, what has happened is they have... Um, tested and determined that it doesn't end up in the eggs. And a lot of times that's what happens is whatever medication it is, 
they've, they've done the testing to determine that the residues from it don't end up in that product. So for example, you'll see some products that are approved for use um, in dairy cows, but not beef cows or differently, differently dosed in dairy cows versus beef cows because um, it does end up at different levels or sometimes not at all in either the meat or the milk. So it's different. Mm -hmm. Um, so they've determined that there's no withdrawal requirement for emproleum, which is which is what's in most medicated chick start feeds. It's the it's the generally accepted coccidiostat medication. So. so there's a question from Robbie. What size should the laying boxes be? Uh, laying, so what I like to use. Um, so generally, you want it slightly bigger than your hens. So for me, I like those plastic dish pan size. From the dollar store they're maybe 12 by 18 12 by 20 just you know a few inches bigger than the hen on all sides um, i love those what i did was i actually designed my um, nest box to hang on the outside of my coop so that i could open it and access and each slot fits one of those dollar store plastic dish pans perfectly and the reason i really like those is number one they're cheap then with the dollar store they're a dollar if they get broke, if they get disgusting, you can throw them out and buy a new one. You can also, because they're plastic, wash and sanitize them if they get gross, if you're so inclined. Um, so that's why I really like those um, over other things. For example, wood is not disinfectable. Not always a problem in an S box, as long as you're not having a lot of problems with broken eggs or really dirty boxes, you can just change the bedding. But I think those dish pans are just so convenient. If the bedding is dirty, I can just pull them out, dump it, put fresh in and put it all back super quick and easy and cheap, and they're perfectly sized. What is the name of the type of uh, chicken to get the chocolate colored egg? Moran's, M-A-R-A-N-S, Moran's. And there are a, a variety of them that come in different colors. There's ones that come barred, they look like a barred rock. You know what a barred rock chicken looks like, that striped black and white. There's ones called Cuckoo Moran's, there's Midnight Moran's. People have bred all sorts of variations. But generally, Moran's will lay a very deep chocolate brown colored egg. Can you feed um, dry bread to yes. chicken? Yes, so you can. Um, I will tell you it's not super, it doesn't have a lot of nutritional value for them, though. So it's not going to hurt them. It would be a fantastic treat to give to your chickens every now and then. Just make sure you're not overdoing it. Um, as with any of us, if we have too many treats, um, obesity is not good for chickens um, either. It really, it actually can really cause some of those abnormal egg problems that we've seen. I didn't even talk about that, but it can be a problem, particularly um, egg bound is often a problem with obesity um, as well as some of those like flat, like abnormally shaped eggs as well. Um, so keep it, treat amounts minimal here and there, but it's certainly not gonna hurt them and they probably will really like it, so. <laughs> okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Is it safe to eat an egg from a hen with a sauerkraut infection? Yes, so that that the reproductive tract and the digestive tract are two completely separate tracts. In fact, technically the digestive tract is considered external to the body because it is open to the environment at both ends, if that makes sense. That infection is not going to get into her reproductive tract and end up in her eggs. Um, it is something that we want to make sure we're taking care of. Um, but the only thing would be is if you end up treating her with something like antibiotics, you're going to make sure, want to make sure that you follow any withdrawal times from any medications you might give her um, during the course of her treatment. But if she's not being treated with anything that has a withdrawal time, then it's perfectly fine. I wanted to introduce Dara Yazi. He's on the line as well or on the call. He is uh, the tribal extension agent that serves uh, Northern Arizona as well on the, on the southern part of the Navajo Reservation. Correct, Daryl? And he's out of Salee. So I just maybe if you can get on the phone, I mean, get on the video and just wave. He's just another resource for people in the community um, who does great work. But awesome. he, he asked, how many years do hens lay before they have to get replaced to prevent any deformity or possible diseases? Very okay. good. So that's a little bit of a, a couple different questions wrapped up in one there. So how long will chickens lay is gonna depend a little bit on your management in the breed. Most of our normal heritage breeds that we have um, are probably gonna lay two to five years 
depending on if you've put them on lights. So if you've put them on lights so that they lay more consistently during the winter time, that sort of thing, you're gonna get a little closer to that two to three year mark out of them. They're born with a finite number of eggs. Those little ovum germinal discs that are on those yolks, they're born with all of them that they will ever have. And so when they run out, they obviously stop laying eggs, right? Because they've run out. And so if they're using them all up, quicker because we're not taking breaks in the winter time, that sort of thing will run out of them faster and will reduce our laying lifespan. If we're sort of letting them go natural and not, not providing extra light and they're maybe taking a little break in the middle of winter and a little break in the middle of the summer, and um, then we might get a little bit longer lay time out of them. In terms of it, them developing diseases, they're not necessarily more prone to diseases because they're older. They are maybe more prone to some problems, being egg bound, that sort of thing. Um, if you choose to replace them, um, you, can, you can simply choose to call them, I would say, as soon as you start noticing a significant decline in production, which will probably happen around years three to four, you know, depending on, depending on all those things. Um, but, in, but as long as they're continuing to lay, there's no reason that you need to replace them um, unless your goal is a high production, um, almost more commercial, like you wanting to sell eggs and you only can have a finite number of hens. And so you need hens that are laying every single day, if that makes sense. Whereas yeah. if, you're more, if you more have them for your own enjoyment and that kind of thing, there's no reason to call them unless you want to. Got it. Does that, does that make sense? Was that yeah, just, just, and then also another question aside from that, um, what do you do with your cold chickens? <laughs> That's a great question. Actually, Susan and I were talking about that earlier. So um, can they be eaten? Yes. Are they going to be good? No. <laughs> so um, okay. older hens that have been around. So the, the chickens that you normally eat that you buy in the grocery store or at you know, the meat market, whatever you buy them, are generally very young, seven to 10 weeks old. And they have been bred to reach a mature size very quickly. The hens that are bred for egg production, you know, if you're calling them at three years old, they're gonna be tough, they're gonna be stringy, they're gonna taste a little eh, they're not gonna be great. Are there some things you could do to salvage a carcass and end up with a good, a decent meal out of it? Yes. You could try some soups, some stews, ground chicken if you have a grinder, that sort of thing. Um, quite frankly, I let mine live out their natural life because I don't have a reason to cull them. And I'm not interested in eating them for this reason that they're just not going to be good. Um, and I am not doing it to make money so that if they, I have to pay a little more in feed, I don't care. If, you if, if that's a concern for you, you may choose to cull. Um, what, what a lot of egg producers will do is they, and they actually have a compost and they, there, there are ways to compost chicken carcasses effectively and end up with them helping your compost. It, they won't smell. Um, there, there are ways to do that properly that is an accepted disposal method. Did that answer your question? Yeah, it did. Thank you. Okay. You're very welcome. Okay. I guess one last question. Have you ever done a uh, duck eggs? Have I, ever ha have I ever had duck eggs or? No, like uh, had ducks for having duck eggs. So I haven't, but um, lots of people do. Um, yeah. Duck eggs are, are actually, I've had duck eggs. They're very good. My grandma swears by them for baking because they're so big. The one thing I will say is um, it is a little harder to get clean ones. They don't tend to go nest like chickens do. They just sort of lay eggs in the mud wherever they are, if they have mud. So it can be a little more challenging from that aspect. Um, but if that's something that you guys are interested in, um, let Susan know, and if there's enough interest, I can try to find us somebody to come in and who has more knowledge than me on that and talk about that. I wanted to know what you do about the excess calcium. Right, right. That's you're getting like those little, um, the little bumps, like it, it's almost like someone threw paint on them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, um, when you, when you get that, there could be a couple things. When are you providing extra calcium, like oyster shell or anything like that? Are you feeding a layer feed? Can you give me a little um, idea of what you're feeding? Just mainly the, mainly the layer feed. We've only done the oyster shells like one time. But they don't. They didn't really like it, so we just didn't. We just took it out of their diet. Okay. Um. So that's a challenging one because usually when I see that, it's because chickens are um, 
on a layer fee, they're eating that really well, and then they're being provided oyster, which is which is usually recommended, but for some reason they've chosen these chickens have become obsessed with it and have chosen to eat too much. That's usually when I see it. Um, so the fact that you've taken it out and you're still seeing it, it could be that you're having, um, um, I'm sorry, a phosphorus deficiency. Um, because remember, mm -hmm. I talked about those two sort of working in balance with each other and that you right. want that specific ratio. So it could be that we need to look at your phosphorus and see, but if you're feeding a, yeah, if you're feeding a, a balanced layer ration, are you feeding, yeah, um, some do have higher calcium. I see your comment there. Are you, do you know which one you're feeding? Potentially be a water quality issue too. There's some testing we can have sent off um, if we can't figure out what it is in the feed. Okay, that, great. Does that sound okay? I'll drop my, I'll drop my yeah, that's email. Good. In the chat right Thank here. You. Great. So I guess the first thing we need to do as the as the people who are raising the chicks is go check out our feed. Let's go yeah. look at the brand. Let's look at the calcium and phosphorus, you know, amounts and get some of that uh, information that we can bring to the conversation. So what I've been actually wanting to do is um take my chickens off of like the name brand and kind of do more of like a homemade chicken feed. What do you okay. recommend for something like that? So that, that it, it's, it's a little challenging to do, but it is, it is doable. So what you would want to do is figure out which grain commodities that you can, um, that you can easily source where you're at. So you're going to be looking at things probably like uh, corn, um, oats, um, maybe even DDGs, um, whatever we can get. And we'll, what we can do is we'll have to look at what you can get look at the different levels of those, um, get them sort of lined out, um, what that balance ratio should be. Um, I do not know off the, I know cattle better, so I do not know off the top of my head what would be ideal for chickens, but we have resources, we can look that up. And then we'll need to source some sort of a mineral mix that will complement um, what's in your, because your grains are gonna have some amount, right? The grains tend to be very high in phosphorus, um, and have certain amounts of certain macro and micro minerals. And so we'll need to find a mineral mix to put in there at the right amount to complement that, to get all those minerals at the right base levels and not excesses of too many things. Um, Cause as you start getting into excesses, like especially like iron, if you have too much iron, it can be really antagonistic. So even though you may be giving them enough copper, it's blocking them from absorbing it. So there's a lot of things to pull into balance. It's challenging. Um, it's challenging, but it's, um, something that we can look at if send me an email and we'll we'll see what we can we can do independently what you can source. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, North 40 as well for mentioning that Coconino County has reports of high levels of calcium in the wells there. Um, that they he's, he's I'm gonna bet that's gonna be our culprit. Yeah, I, I was just thinking, yeah, the water could be I was just thinking, how are my how would my chickens be getting an excess of calcium? A lot of people forget about the water. There are minerals in water and it does vary quite a bit by region. Um, so that's something that we can look at. And if it is um, that there's excess calcium in the water, we have a few ways to deal with that. Um, we can put an inline filtration in just, they're not very expensive. You just literally plug them right into your hose um, so that it gets filtered out as it goes into the bucket. We can, we can do some different things um, to look at bringing that down for your chickens to see if that helps. For those of you who are participating on the call from Hopi, um, each one of your uh, the, the villages who runs your water systems, they actually test the water, and they you can get reports of what's in the in your water um, from the villages that you get your water sources from. So that's a resource for you to get that information. You don't have to go test it yourself. Ashley Wright referenced a lot of the previous workshops that we've held. There was three others before tonight, and they're all listed on our extension website. You're welcome to go back and check any one of those out and revisit them again. I had a quick question again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I've been also feeding our chickens um, uh, hay scraps of alfalfa. Mm -hmm. um, does that do anything? Like, does it have any effect, or is it just something... A, a little bit. So the thing to remember with chickens is that they're not, they're not ruminant animals, right? They're not like cows. They don't, yeah. they don't consume forages as well as they consume like grain products. Um, they're also actually omnivores. They like bugs and things. So while it's certainly not going to hurt them, they will probably chew on it a little bit. It is a great fiber. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. I would just be cautious. Number one, that you're not diluting their main diet too much, that they're not consuming more of that, which I don't think they would. I think palatability wise, they're going to eat their feet first. 
Yeah. Um, but also just make sure that they're not eating a ton of the long stems. Now, the good thing about alfalfa is it tends to be thicker stemmed and they'll probably, they're probably just eating the leaves off of it. Mm -hmm. um, one concern that I have seen with people feeding hay, especially if it's less stemmy and more, less mature so that the, the stems aren't as thick, is if they eat too many of the stems, they can get balled up in their crop and cause impaction in sour crop. Oh. Uh, so then with alfalfa, again, most of the time the stems on alfalfa are so thick, they're not even going to try to eat them. They're just going to pick the leaves off and call it good. Yeah. Um, typically, I see that problem with things like Bermuda hay. Um, I had one hen that wanted to eat Bermuda hay. I don't know why. And she ended up with impacted crop because she ate a whole bunch of Bermuda hay and it wadded up in her crop and wouldn't go anywhere. Whereas all the other hens were like, this is not food. It's just fun to scratch in. So why she decided to eat it, I don't know. But um, so that's just something to be cognizant of. I also like uh, bury some mealworms or like the, the worms at the bottom of the hay pile. And then they'll just pick at it slowly. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's. That's great enrichment. Um, we call that enrichment, and that's things that help them do their natural behaviors, right? Foraging is very natural for behavior for chickens. Yeah. Um, they like to dig for bugs and dig for mealworms, and that's actually um, one of the things that I'll do too is I'll throw out um, something or some shavings and sprinkle mealworms in it, and they'll spend hours digging up all those little mealworms. Mm -hmm. um, and it does, it keeps them busy, it keeps them out of trouble, keeps them from picking on each other, it gives them something to occupy their little chicken brains. Wow. Um, and I think you end up with a little happier, healthier chicken, um, just because they're not bored, they have something to do. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you, every, everyone. So you had some really great questions. So um, please think, help me in thank you, Ashley. Thank you very You're much. You're welcome. Thank you for all your knowledge and, and help. And I hope this helps you become a better egg producer in your backyard. Thank Thanks, you, everyone. everyone.